Um, but now I want to turn to a more theological and practical conversation um, and to, to really think about how um, this shows up in our communities and eventually leading us to a conversation about what we can do about it. Um, so just to lead us off, um, you know, could you all, could you both name some of the theological problems with Christian national, Christian nationalism narratives? You know, in the church and in the public, we have a broad spectrum of theological perspectives on religion. And I, so I'm not asking either of you to speak on behalf of all Christians, um, but from your position, what are some of the most basic theological flaws with Christian nationalism? Since the beginning of the, the Christian movement, um, one of the earliest confessions of faith uh, was Jesus is Lord which was seen as a direct threat to, at that time, the Roman Empire and the emperor. It was a threat to the state. Um, and Christians faced persecution because they, they declared that their primary allegiance was not to any temporal or secular um, government, but it was, to, it was to the Lord. So that, that's a primary problem in all this. And for, um, for Lutherans, uh, you, all of you get out your small catechisms and look up Luther's uh, explanation of the first and second commandments. It's a perversion of how we understand uh, that we're in fact citizens um, with the saints and not citizens primarily or ultimately of any one uh, temporal government. Bishop Curry, what would you add to that? No, I, I would, I'd want to affirm and amen that um, if you look at the history of Christianity, when it has gone astray, whether it is in support of slavery or silence in the midst of evil against any people, uh, the suppression of people, injustices, there's a consistent pattern that Jesus of Nazareth, his actual te his teachings, his example, his spirit, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew 25, uh, the parable of the sheep and goats, the Good Samaritan, that Jesus of Nazareth gets moved aside and suppressed for a broad, ambiguous Christ figure who can be adapted to any cultural context or adapted to anybody's whims. And so it is this Jesus of Nazareth, this Jesus, um, as, as, as uh, Bishop Eaton has said, Christ as Lord, not Caesar. When that Jesus Christ is compromised, we're gonna find danger. It is danger Will Robinson at that point. And you see it in Christian nationalism. You've seen it in all the isms where Christianity, whether it has been um, theological uh, ways of being comfortable with apartheid, whether it, it was in the uh, Nazi church, whether it has been in white supremacist Christianity, um, you name it. Every time the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount, the Jesus of the parable of the Good Samaritan, the Jesus says you, who says you shall love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself on these two hang all the law and the prophets, that Jesus gets suppressed and put aside. So it, it is a violation of Christianity based on Jesus Christ as Lord from the very beginning. And that is a, that begins all sorts of trouble. <laughs> Well, and, and you both point out just how foundational, you know, what a threat this is to the very foundation of our faith. And I think Professor Whitehead showed just how pervasive Christian nationalism is in our culture. And, and so I'm curious um, to hear where you see Christian nationalism to be the most prevalent um, from, from your perspectives as religious leaders. Where do you see Christian nationalism showing up? Well, I, um, I, th I think it's, it's very important to understand that we are not condemning being uh, patriot patriotic. That's different. Christian nationalism conflates um, our allegiance and our understanding, and even our um, uh, uh, relationship with God with a particular secular state, in the case of the United States, uh, to be a, a, a Christian country. And so you cannot, by that definition, be a real American unless you're a certain kind of Christian. And for us, for Lutherans, um, you know, we number our commandments different. So when there are big arguments about what sh should be in a courthouse, we don't have to worry about that because we, we number ours differently. But for us, the second commandment is that you should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And, and, and Luther said that, um, that, that, that this, this kind of thing of, of, of appropriating this uh, is, he said, see, all of this is an attempt to deck yourself out with God's name or put up a good front and justify yourself, my emphasis, or your cause with God's name. And we see that with folks. It's different from patriotism. 
But when our allegiance is, is first of, and our, our, our identity and meaning is caught up in Christian nationalism and not in God, then that's a, that's a problem. And we can slip into that very easily. We see this uh, in time of, of warfare, in time of crisis, and certainly we're in a crisis now. Yeah, I have to, to say that, that um, there, I suppose there are innocent forms of Christian nationalism and less innocent forms of it. Um, but but I, I mean, I grew up in the black church. Um, I'm an Episcopalian, been an Episcopalian all my life, but I grew up in a black Episcopal church. And in my congregation, when I was a kid, I remember it was, it was a mixed congregation of blacks from the uh, West Indies and blacks from America, but it was a black congregation. Um, and I vaguely remember some dispute in the early 60s about the flag because the Union Jack was actually was in the church as well. And I'm guessing that there was a controversy among the uh, uh, those from the West Indies and, and, and Americans. Anyway, the compromise was that both the American flag and the Union Jack were both kind of put up on a balcony. So you can see they weren't up front near where the altar was. And I'm, I'm guessing that was the compromise. Um, now, again, that's kind of a nationalism, I mean, but it's more, um, it, it's more cultural heritage, which is a kind of national, that's probably fairly innocent, if you will. There's the more virulent or dangerous kind that sees my nation, whatever it happens to be, it's we're number one because we're God's favorite. Um, we're number one, you see what I mean? It's, and that borders on blasphemy, idolatry. Um, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods but me. Whatever the number, correct number is, that's in the Ten Commandments. And, and, and that kind of nationalism is dangerous. Um, it is dangerous to civic health. It is dangerous to the health of Christianity. And it is dangerous to humanity. Because when it gets going, um, it means if we're God's favorite and we're the chosen ones and we're in charge, then everybody else is secondary. And that leads to all sorts of things. And, and we've seen that. So black folk, even if they hold that kind of, that nationalism, it's probably more an innocent Christian nationalism because they've seen the danger um, of Christianity and white supremacy conflated and they know it when they see it. I think there are other people who have the same discernment because of their experience that leads them to discern the difference between the kind of Christian nationalism that, that is becomes very dangerous quickly and the kind that while it's problematic is probably more innocent. I've seen, the we've seen the dangerous kind. Um, we've, I'm just gonna say it. I have always known, I'm 67 years old, been black for all those 67 years. And I have known since I was a childhood that the Klan professed to be Christian. That not in this country professed to be Christian. We grew up knowing that. So we knew there was an unholy conflation of Christianity and white supremacy. And it was often tinged with Americanism. <laughs> we knew that. Dr. King articulated the ideals of America, not that kind of, but the ideals of an America where there is liberty and justice for all, um, and the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth and the aspirations of the human soul. That's not Christian nationalism. That's, that's a kind of civic religion, if you will, that is legitimate. It lifts people up. It sets people free. And that is consistent with Christianity. The other is not. Yeah. I think I'm impressed that uh, your church handled it so well. I think uh, one of the f quickest ways to start a congregational conflict is to move the, uh, the American flag out of the chancel. In the last parish I served, and they, you know, they figured it out pretty quickly, but the flag was inside the communion rail, and it was held up by a Boy Scout tent pole it hastily put up after the first Gulf War and, and, and uh, had it bricks was that was the flag stand and it only had 48 stars. And then it was excommunicating the people around the corner because I couldn't reach them with communion, not really. So uh, <laughs> that's that's the people get mixed that mixed up. Um, I have a, a colleague who said um, to me uh, that he sees it that when the church gathers, that gathered community is an embassy for the kingdom of God which can be never confused, never confused or identified with any other earthly nation, state, ruler, or political party. And another thing that's, I think, um, per perhaps 
it's, it's been part of the American uh, ethos for so long. There are two myths um, and, and about America. I mean, there are a lot of other ones, but I'll name these two. First of all, um, this notion that um, it was uh, very prevalent amongst Puritans was that God had formed a new covenant with this new nation or their community. A covenant, as, as a covenantal relationship that these people would be um, a shining, uh, a, a city on the hill. We've heard that rhetoric before. The second one was that the founding fathers and they're very clear about saying fathers were men who were Christians and a certain kind of Christian. Actually, Jefferson took scissors to scripture, so I'm not, not so sure. Um, he was one of yours too, Bishop Curry, and he got kicked off the vestry because he could never come to meetings. Um, but then this was intentionally formed, not based on principles that could be found in Christianity, but specifically as a Christian nation, a covenantal relationship. And in this, we will prosper and also be a light to the rest of the world which is not how we as Lutherans understand uh, government at all. 